Welcome to the College of Complexes. So you want to be scared? Come here. Imagine another four years of Trump. Imagine the Democratic Socialists taking over our country. Just imagine the Green New Deal being passed. Lots of scary ideas. <laughs> and tonight we're going to debate them. But we have tonight our speaker who's a theoretical spiritualist. But first, let me explain the bloody rules. First, there is no personal attacks. And second, remember this, one fool at a time. We, the college consists of the following format. Our speaker will speak for up to an hour. Then we shall take your questions. And then, of course, the scariest part after the question and answer period is your rebuttals. <laughs> and, of course, the scariest parts of all, our speaker will get to rebut all of you and perhaps scare you half to death with his rebuttal of your rebuttals. Perhaps we may see a few things like egos be crushed. A few more scary things like uh, a rebutter or your MC being thrown off the stage. Well, let's get to it. First, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, a theoretical spiritualist. College regular Ed Rios will be providing a theoretical basis for the unseen world and the soul. Can we please welcome Ed Rios? Come on, we can do better than this. Wow. Take it away, Ed. I didn't know you get speech. Wow. You know, we can do better because you have me speak. <laughs> we don't. We don't need a lot of blabberizing, Charlie. We need a good we speech. Can do better. Hello. No personal attacks, sir. <laughs> All right. Well. Let me start off with what I'm reserve that for one year speaking, Charlie. Following this outline I've made here. Okay. First, I want to talk yes. about the College of Complexes. I've been coming here since the 80s. And in that time, I've met a lot of people. I've heard a lot of opinions. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And by that, I mean. Um, <coughs> I learned that no matter what the speaker says, the people who come here have their opinion, they're going to take it, they're going to form it into their opinion, and then they're going to come with, up with questions. Very few minds can change. Um, I will tell you that decades ago, a very, an old man, someone who was in his um, 60s at the time in 80, in the 80s, so he was born in the 20s, I guess. He told me this allegory. He told me about the Wizard of Oz. And he told it to me this way. He goes, the Wizard of Oz is an allegory. And that's why it was so popular. It wasn't only a children's story, but it was an allegory for adults. Okay? The, the yellow brick road represented gold. Okay? The Emerald City represented the dollar because emerald green is the greenback, the dollar. The um, wizard who was behind the Emerald City was a power that be that really had no, that was really just an ordinary person. Okay? The um, lion was. Um, Oh, the speaker who said, um, who was a politician, Brian, Brennan, Brian? William Jennings. William Brian. Jennings Bryan, who said, will not, you will not bury us on a cross of gold. Yeah, um, and that was a cowardly lion. And the house 
fell on the witch. I forget whether it was the witch of the north, possibly. The mm. house fell on one of the witches, which was, and the other witch, the evil witch, was a banker. Okay? And in the movie, the Cossacks who are marching into the into the castle say, have a, a little ditty they hum. Oh, we, oh, oh, we, oh. And he told me that the real words were, oh, we, oh, we owe her. And I had to go write the movie again to see if it was true. But in the movie, it's not. It is just the hum. But what he was telling me was, what made The Wizard of Oz so good was that for adults, it was an allegory. And for children, it was a story. You know? um, now, to continue with chapter one of my talk, stories, I want to tell you a little bit about my father. Okay? My, my father, he spoke of, um, he was born basically in Europe in 1917 in the country which was the equivalent of the Middle Ages. It just hadn't changed in all those years. Right? What country? Spain. And he told me one of the things, he made a model ox cart out of wood, and he told me that um, how it was made. Not his model, but a real ox cart. He said there's a spine, there's a big heavy member, oxen on both sides of it, that goes the length of the cart. And that member is made of oak. And then you have two side pieces that come off that are also oak. And then the platform is made of pine, something inexpensive that they could replace. And then the axle was made of chestnut, because chestnut was an oily wood. And then he had a little piece on the side. I said, what's this? He goes, that's the break. I go, why do you need a break? And he goes, well, if you're going down, if you have a load and you're going downhill, you have to tie this break off because you don't want the wagon to get away from the oxen. So you put the brake on so the wagon doesn't push the oxen down the hill. And I go, wow. And then he told me another story. Or actually, when he was near death, my cousin in um, my brother's wife in New York who came uh, recorded some stories. And one of them was went like this. He literally slept in, there were like five or six kids. Both parents had died by the time he was nine years old. He had slept in the, uh, he had shared a bedroom with his grandma. And his grandma told him this story. No. Excuse me. Grandma told him this story. Back in, there was a large family home called the Casa de Castro. Okay. And the Casa de Castro had two sons in it, and during the Argentine War of Liberation, the two sons were the two sons were um, drafted in a sense and had to go to Argentina to fight the war. Okay. One of them was left for dead in the field. The other one came home. The one who was left for dead after a battle, the the natives came through to to scavenge. And they found him, and they, he was alive, and they, they brought him back to the, to the village and, and nursed him back to health. And he didn't want to leave. He got married, and he stayed there, and he had a family. And one of his sons was a um, longshoreman in Buenos Aires. And every time a boat from Spain would come, this longshoreman would ask them if they were from the locate of the state, Galicia, and if they were, if they heard of the Casa de Castro, and if they knew anything about it. And eventually he came across someone who could answer his questions. And the guy said to him, Yes, I know the house. The house is in disrepair. One of the brothers died in Argentina. 
And the guys and the longshoreman said, no, 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 that brother was my father. He thought and thought he was found, he got caught that. And then that sailor brought the story back to Spain. That sailor told the people in the community, the people in the community told my great grandmother, who was a child at the time, who told my father when he was a child, who told us shortly before he died. And then when I got home, I looked up the war, Argentine War of Liberation, and that happened in 1812. Okay? So here we have a continuity, a story that's now 200 years old. Okay. Um, now we come to this story. I'm going to give you pieces that enter my mind, that I file in the back of my head, that I go, huh. And this one goes like this. It's the Bible. And it goes, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, which is basically everything in, in, in so many words. The earth was a void and shapeless. Okay? Then God said, let there be light. And it goes on, and then it goes, on the third day, God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear. Now, why I filed this story in the back of my head was, I'm like, this story, it could be Babylonian, it could be, you know, Israeli, uh, Jewish, it could be, you know, or not, or what is it called? Arab, the uh, Persian, okay? But regardless, whoever developed this story was essentially a sheep herder. Might have even been a carpenter. Might have been a wheat farmer. Even if he was the king, the storyteller was not far removed from a sheep herder. Okay? And I was like, what right does a sheep herder have to say, in the beginning was the void? And what right does he have to say, and then there was light? And what right does he have to say, and then the earth was separate, the waters were, the earth rose out of the sea? Because we know now that that's the way it happened. There was a void. And then there was life. And then we know from the history of the earth that in the very beginning, there was just one landmass that then separated into the continents we have today. But initially, it was just one. Okay? So what happened to me was, well, that's an interesting story. And I just filed it away. There's nothing to read into it. I mean, the story by itself has nothing to read into it. Okay. Now, I'm moving on to chapter two, which is memory. Okay, I gave this talk about 10, no, about 15, 20 years ago. And this is one of the new elements, memory, okay? When I was dealing in video, all right, and recording video. At first, all we had was black and white. And with the black and white cameras, I knew how much memory, how much, how much, how many minutes of image I could have on this, I could store, you know, on the tape or on the disc, okay? And then we went to color. Color was much more complicated. All right, color stores need to, to display color. You need to store a lot more information. All right, so I realized, like, wow, storing images takes a lot of memory. Now, here's the point that recently came to mind. If all of you can picture driving somewhere, either in a car or in a bus, just driving somewhere. And the world is passing you at like 30, 40, 60 miles an hour, all right? And as this is flying by, 
you are not only seeing it all, you're remembering it all. Okay? Now, how do we ex how do we what theory do we have for memory? Our current theory for memory is that it's interlinks of all the billions of cells, axions that we have in our head. Are, they're creating new ones all the time, and these new ones make memory. Okay? Now, if you go back to the image I just gave you of driving down the street at 30, 40, 60 miles an hour, and seeing all of those images go by, just imagine what you're seeing. Go back to see a, a recent experience. You have cars, you have bridges, you have road signs, you have the car to the left, you have the size of the road, you have the weather conditions. You have everything of that ride in your memory. And I just can't see how the brain, how the human body can grow connections that fast. Okay? It's like you're talking about images shooting at you. Boom, 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 boom. You're traveling 60 miles an hour. Things are flying, literally flying by. And the current theory is connections are growing and that's memory. I can't see it. I can't I don't think the body grows things that fast to remember everything you just saw as you were simply riding down the road. And I said to myself, and if it is connections, then why hasn't my head exploded? I have like almost 70 years of connections. They're growing all the time. It's like you can tell me, well, you forget some of them. Yeah, they do, unless they hypnotize you and they take you into a regression and they say, why did I don't and these things come back. Okay? So I'm like, I don't buy it. I don't buy that memory is a physical connection that is grown from one thing, you know, that's grown. Okay. Now I'm going to chapter three. Chapter three is called The Story of a Lifetime. This is also new to the talk and it's subtitled The Observer, all right? Now I'm going to take you through a human life, typical human life. It has a couple of elements, baby, toddler, child, adolescent, adult, and elderly, okay? Now the baby, we know, is like uh, just a little bottle mass, nothing to remember there. Then we go to the toddler, okay? The toddler is special, okay? Now, none of us can remember being a toddler. We kind of remember some things, okay? And if you remember a toddler, yeah. these toddlers are somewhere like 24 inches high, all right? And they're running, falling, laughing, giggling, that, all right, and those of you who remember being a toddler, congratulations, all right? Now, when you're a toddler and you go to the next step, which is being a child, there's a little transition, all right? What happens is that the experiment works this way. If you take three glasses, okay, or maybe four, what you have is a glass on the table, that's tall, a glass on the table that's short and fat, and two glasses that are identical that are full to the same height. Okay? Now, if you take the liquid from one and pour it into the tall glass, it'll fill up to a high level. You take the liquid from the other and pour it into the short glass, it'll fill up to a low level. And if you ask the toddler which one has more liquid, the toddler will say, it, the tall glass has more. <coughs> it's a toddler. The toddler is not fully there. Okay? Now, somewhere around five or six years old, the toddler develops the ability 
to reason this out. And at five or six, if you do the same experiment, pour the glass into the tall one, pour the equal volume into the short one, and ask the five or six year old, which one has more? The five or six year old will say, they have the same. Okay? Big transition from a toddler to a child. Now, I'm going to ask you to remember, and actually I'm not, I'm going to ask you to picture a child. A child is someone who is running around, who has friends, who's screaming and yelling, who is like so excited to be alive. A child is a bunch of energy. Okay? Then the child develops, moves on to being an adolescent. They develop hormones, their bodies change. And I'm going to ask you to picture, actually there's a period between like puberty and 25, right? That they call the limbic system, the development of the limbic system. The limbic system is part of the brain that does your, that prevents you from acting like a teenager, okay? When you're a teenager, when I became 25, and I look back at my life, I remember saying to myself, anybody who lives past 25 is lucky. Because you do so many stupid things, all right? And I'm not gonna ask you to remember, well, try it. Try to remember your, your adolescence. Okay? Or try to picture an adolescent that you know. Someone who's running around, not running around, but someone who's caught up with friends, with what's going on in the world, who's caught up with everything. Someone who's trying to find their way, etc., so on and so okay. forth. Someone who's emotional, lost, confused, does stupid things, gets into fights, gets out of fights, drives cars while they're drunk. Okay? This is an adolescent. Then we have the adult. The adult we're all familiar with, much more stable. Okay. Then we have the elder. The elder's in the stage I'm in now. I will tell you something I always thought was funny. Every five or ten years, or make it eight or ten years, some group puts out a study that goes something like this. We went and asked the elderly if they had to live their life all over again, what would they do differently? And every one of the elderly say, I would spend more time with friends and family. Okay? Now I happen, when I first heard that, I happen to remember my young adulthood. And I can tell you that the last thing I wanted to do was spend time with my old friends and family. Okay? I had other things to do. And, and this is the adult. And now we have the elderly. Okay? Now, this is the second part of my talk that I'm adding to this lecture, okay? The second part is this. When I look back, I was there the whole time. I was present as a child, as an adolescent, as a young adult, as an adult. The me that is here now was there then. I do not look at the five-year-old. I do not look at the five-year-old who couldn't tell the difference between a glass of water, half full or not, and the, the teenager and puberty and 
that old song that goes, working on mysteries without any clues, working on some night moves. That old song which tells you growing up as a teenager is like one adventure after another. Through all of that, the me that is here now today in front of you is the same me who was there then. Okay? And I said to myself, maybe that's the soul. Maybe that me that has been constant through the last 65 years is the soul. I'm no expert, okay? But that's the thought. Now, to continue with the story of a lifetime. I want to tell you of a lady, and the references, if you want, the references are with Tim. Just ask him for a slip, he'll give it to you right. Okay? I'll pass them along. This lady called Jill Bolt Taylor, who in 2008 wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight. And Jill is a neuroanatomist, worked at MIT, okay, who had a stroke. She was at her home, the stroke happened, she didn't know what was going on, all right. She had a blood vessel burst on her left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is our linear thinking filing cabinet that someone who's in neuroanalysis gets an awful lot of use out of. Okay? But she lost that. She tells a story of losing that, of going to the hospital, of witnessing the doctors and nurses talking about her. She tells a story of recovery, of everything she went through. She tells a story, and at the end of her book, I was very annoyed because nowhere in her observation does she ever mention that the observer was not affected by the loss of half of her brain. Okay? She does not say, I am, I was handicapped. She does not say, I suffered. I suffered. She says my body suffered. She says I had limit. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move my arms. Um, but she doesn't say that she was affected. She never, ever, ever lets you know that the observer, this observer who lost half of her brain, was affected by the loss of half of her brain. Okay? And it's in the it's in the the handle. Okay. But she now if you go to the web and look her up, and again the handout will have her name in there. If you go to her first name is Jill, so you know which one it is. If you go to the web and look her up and view her TED talk, or view her you heard talk with Oprah. And it's been passed. No, that's that's my notes for this talk. If you want to look up the people. Um, her left hemisphere was gone. Her right hemisphere was what was left. God is not right. Her left hemisphere was severely damaged. They took a golf ball sized blood clot out of her head. Okay. Well, she found her experience. The her that was telling the story was now in the right hemisphere, experiencing the right hemisphere. And she tells how the right hemisphere is a all-encompassing, uh, it's like an everything hemisphere. There is no me, there is no you, 
everything, we're all connected, da da da. That's her right yeah, hemisphere experience. Okay? She doesn't. She doesn't. A neuroanalyst, someone who graduated and was dissecting brains for a living out of MIT, doesn't ever say, I lost half of my computer and it affected my me, the observer. She says, questions are later. She says, I lost half of my computer. I couldn't move my arms. My da, 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 da. I couldn't talk. But I was basically the same. Even though she was experiencing the world through entirely different eyes. So then, here's something that happened to me. Most of us, when I said before that this, as I look back at my life, I see that the I who is here now has always been here. Okay? Well, I relate that, associate that very strongly with the sound of my voice. Okay? That I very strongly associated with the sound of my voice. Now, I had a, proce a procedure where they were looking for some throat cancer, something in my throat, and they had this little scope and they shot some, you know, Novocaine in my nose and they pushed this little camera up my nostril, down out the back to see the throat, all right? And the camera, not the camera, the monitor was right in front of me. They were recording it so they could see it later. The monitor was right in front of me, and there in front of me was my larynx, my vocal cords. The camera had it displayed on the screen in front. And I said, whoa. And I didn't say that. My vocal cords went, whoa. And out of my mouth, through the cavity I have here, came the sound, whoa which I immediately recognized as me. But I also saw that it wasn't me. It was this flap of skin doing that it wasn't me. It was very, it was very like, oh my god, that's not me. Couldn't go very further with that except to say, that's not me, okay? <coughs> Now, the other thing to tell you about this story of my life, the observer, and how, in my experience, I associate the observer very much with the sound of my voice, okay, is the story of Helen Keller. Most everybody here knows Helen Keller. Okay? Helen Keller became deaf and blind at 19 months old. Before that, she was a baby, but at 19 months, now remember, 19 months, baby, doesn't know how to talk, doesn't know much, at 19 months, they think she had meningitis, and she became blind and deaf. When she was seven, when she was seven, she started to learn words. And it's a famous story about her Sullivan, I believe, was the, the nurse, and the thing with the water is actually true. And she once she realized that this spelling was words, all right, she went like two, two, two and they spent the day learning words. Okay. Well, Helen Keller went on. Oh, she got a BA. Okay. She joined the International Workers of the World. She worked for women's suffrage. Okay. She wrote a book. The book was turned into a movie. What she says of her time as a human before she started to learn words, she describes it as a sea of dense fog. 
There was a mind with nothing. There were no words, no that she couldn't see, she couldn't hear. She could never see, she could never hear. All right? So it's like, here was a creature, Helen Keller, who couldn't see, who couldn't hear, who earned a BA, who wrote a book, okay? It's like, what was she before, before she started to learn words? She was still alive and human. There was a soul there, but it was like held back. Right? Now, we get to something from quantum physics. Okay? Maybe many of you know this. Some of you, there'll be news. Okay? But in quantum physics, there's something called the observer. Okay? And there's a famous thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat, where there's a decay of a nuclear of uranium, and when it decays, it'll set off release poison that will kill a cat that's in a box. But because there's no observer, no one knows if the decay happened. No one knows if the cat's alive or dead. And their answer is, it's both. It's alive or dead. It's alive and dead. Um, the observer is admittedly a very difficult problem in quantum mechanics. but. What they say is that the observer is the catalyst that does what they call collapses the wave function. Collapses the wave function. In quantum mechanics, particles are probabilities. The position of a particle. There's a famous two-slit experiment where if you shine a light and two slits on the other side of the light will be created on a screen at something called an interference pattern. But if you slow dim the light, and they can do this to the point where it pushes out one photon at a time, okay, and it'll still give you the interference pattern, if, which shouldn't happen because it only happens if the photon goes through, if light goes through both slits, where you get the waves and the interference pattern. Like waves like a drop of a pebble in a pond. Um, but if you, if you set up detectors such that you know which slit the light went through, then the interference pattern disappears, and you get like a point and a point of light hitting. Okay? So I'm saying that in this chapter three, story of a lifetime, I'm saying that baby, toddler, child, adolescent, adult, and el elderly, through all of those stages of my life, there was an observer, constant observer. There was what? Constant observer. What is a constant observer? Observer. Observer. Okay. Then I, for lack of a better word, call that the soul. Okay. Then I bring up the lady who wrote the not the lady the the. The, new, the analytical neurologist who wrote the book, My Stroke of Insight. Go online, look her up in TED Talks, look her up, she spoke on Oprah, she spoke, has TED Talks, she wrote the book, where she never, even though she suffered a serious, serious stroke, never confuses that, never loses herself. 
when if we were mechanical, yeah, you would lose yourself. Then we go to Helen Keller, who couldn't talk or see till she ever see, and couldn't talk but started to understand words at seven. Okay? And she never spoke of herself, but here's somebody who was human, who had a self, had a personality, but didn't have a voice. She knew words, but she didn't know language, the sound of language. Okay? So what I'm saying about this part, story of a lifetime, and we have quantum physics that creates an observer just to solve some of their problems. What I'm saying here in this chapter three, story of a lifetime, is that the observer exists. Now, chapter four, I'm gonna call the circle of life, okay? There's an idea that the human brain is master of all, and that consciousness results from the complexity, arises from the complexity of the human mind. Okay? Now, there's a, dogs, as we all know, learn commands, okay? But there is a dog, and there are several dogs, this one is a Border Collie, and the other one that I know of is a Border Collie. This one is called Chaser, out of, I believe, North Carolina. And you'd have to go to the web and look up Chaser, all right, Border Collie, and it'll take you to two videos. One is from Nova Science, and the other is from 60 Minutes, where they examine this dog. This dog has memorized over a thousand words, okay? One of the videos has Neil deGrasse Tyson goes to the, so what it is is there's a thousand things, toys, underwear, uh, balls, anything. A thousand different things. And on these things, the trainer wrote words, okay? labels. Okay? And the trainer <coughs> taught the dog, or the dog learned, and it learns quickly after it caught on, that the word he hears is associated with this thing, and he is like we do, he names things, okay? Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who you may know, he's the uh, astronomer from New York City, and he's on the show, he's on various shows, okay? Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, the trainer has, it has a dumpster full of these things. They're actually spread on the ground. Okay? Neil goes with a bin and randomly selects a couple of dozen of them. Okay? The owner goes upstairs. Neil comes into the house and dumps these things behind him, behind the sofa that he's sitting on. Okay? And then Neil the dog is not familiar with Neil's voice. Neil says, get the ball. In Neil's accent, New York accent, da da da. And the dog runs behind the sofa and brings back the ball. And then Neil says, get it. And the dog runs behind and brings that. And the dog gets like 12 out of 12 right. The dog knows these words. It's not his master's voice, his teacher's voice. The dog knows these words. He is responding to Neil, and in the 60 Minutes episode, he responds. Okay? Now, they did something else with this dog. 
They had a toy in the behind the couch that wasn't named before. Okay? And they told the dog, and I'm gonna make this up, I don't know. They told the dog to get Spider-Man. Right? And the dog runs to the back and looks around and comes back to Neil empty-handed and then runs to the back again and looks around and he picks up the one thing he doesn't know the name of and he brings it around and that's that was Spider-Man. Okay? So This dog, and I didn't see examples of this, but I saw this on other on description. Okay? This dog recognizes common nouns such as horse, tree, ball. So if you tell the dog horse, he knows all the different horses. Okay? The dog also knows adverbs verbs, and prepositional objects, which is something I don't even know, <laughs> although I know how to use it. This dog understands, this dog called Chaser, understands human speech. Okay? Now, orthodox religious people and scientists have this idea, share this idea, even though they're on direct opposites, share this idea that man is on a pedestal. Okay? That if you try to compare animals to people, you're just doing something they call anthropomorphic extension. All right, you are contributing, attributing, excuse me, you are attributing your perceptions and, and feelings to a dog that has none. Okay? It's silly that scientists and religious people share this belief of putting man on a pedestal, putting sapiens on a pedestal. But Chaser, this dog I just told you about, demonstrates something that we've never done. Chaser has accomplished interspecies communication. Chaser, we we don't know anything about elephants dialogue. Elephants in the wild will put their trunk to the ground to hear the subsonic sounds that another elephant is emitting. We know nothing about whale songs. We know nothing about dolphin chatter. We know nothing about bird songs. Okay? Yet, Chaser does interspecies communication. And we think that we're on a pedestal. Okay. Now, this chapter is called Circle of Life. Okay. What I'm saying here is that we made a mistake. We aren't on a pedestal. That all the animals share, and that this is my this is my understanding that all the animals share the common soul, not the common soul, all the animals share, have a soul or have consciousness. The word, I don't know what the real word, proper word to use is, but all, all creatures have that. Okay, there's a song they sing at the Unitarian Church, all creatures great and small. Yeah. How does it go? Let 
how does it go? Tools down here below, but all languages here below. And it's actually, we're taught, that song refers to humans, but all languages really, all these animals communicate. Okay? And I, here's my idea that what separates us animals is here I stated it here. I postulate okay, the soul or the consciousness of everything alive has the same potential, but the form, the form that they have to work with limits their expression. Even within a human form, okay, there are many expressions. Okay? We have deaf humans, we have blind humans, we have sociopath humans, we have the estrogen testosterone uh, spectrum. We have Down syndrome. We have autism. Okay? Even within humans, in the consciousness, it's, it's their ability to express is limited by their form. And it's the same thing with dogs and birds and all these other animals. Their ability to express is limited by their form. Okay? Now, there are some people, not only people, there are some scientists that will tell you that trees communicate. Yeah. All right? And they will tell you that if one tree is being attacked, this tree will put out a chemical signal, and the other trees will pick it up, and they will make a change in body chemistry or put out more sap or anything to try to protect themselves. And the strange thing about that is there is definitely no mind there. There is definitely no nervous system there. And yet there's communication. There's a tree saying, whoa, I'm under attack. Something without a nervous system is realizing. And then this something without a nervous system puts out a message. How does this, this something without a nervous system know that there are other somethings without nervous systems, brothers and sisters, out there? And then the brothers and sisters say, we hear you, and we're going to take action. All of this without a nervous system. Okay. Now, I'm going to get even smaller. When they go to protozoa, okay? Protozoa have cell walls. They have organelles, the little machinery inside the cell that does metabolism and such. They reproduce and they hunt. All of this in a single cell life form, okay? A single cell life form hunts to feed itself, okay? it's astonishing that something without a nervous system, again, does things so understandable. And my conclusion is that it's the form they occupy. Behind that form is a soul or a consciousness, the same one that animates us. And our ability and the protozoa's ability to express itself is limited by its form. But it behaves in ways we understand because it's conscious, as are we. No more, no less. As a deaf person, an autistic person, a sociopath, Down syndrome, are all conscious, they're all human, no more, no less. Okay? 
Chapter 4, those laws of physics. Physicists observe symmetry in many ways in subatomic particles. An example of symmetry is electron positron. The electron negative charge of positron is exactly like it, but positive charge. Okay? And there are, there are many others. Made it, and when these two particles find each other, they like unite and annihilate themselves. They disappear. Um, I say here, as a theoretical spiritualist, I postulate life as a new law that is the symmetry of entropy. Entropy is the spreading of energy until it is evenly spread. And its, symmetry, its symmetrical law is life. Life is the assembly of energy into everything we have around us. In other words, thermodynamics says everything should fall to a low energy state. And yet, we have something fighting that. Or not, fighting might not be the right word. We have something going in the opposite direction. And for lack of a better word, I'm calling that life. Okay, now, why do I say life is the opposite of entropy? Because on this planet, it exists everywhere. On this planet, at the bottom of the sea, we have thermal vents that have bacteria that live on sulfur, that feed other animals, that eventually feed shrimp and crabs and tube worms, some specialty ones, all right? And there is no sun at the bottom of the sea. They are not photosynthesis. They are not anything related to the surface where we live. Yet they exist. They live on sulfur. Who knew? OK? Life is the opposite of entropy. Entropy is everything falling to a low common denominator. Life is the opposite. Everything coming back. Okay. So, what is to conclude? What is a theoretical spiritualist? Where did I come up with that? I read a lot about Einstein because his theory is so complete that I thought that reading, understanding him was very important. And to my surprise, I learned that Einstein was called a theoretical physicist. Einstein did not do the practical experiments. He was a theorist, theoretician. Okay? I have no ability to do the practical experiments that come with these thoughts. I'm stuck being a theoretical spiritualist. Okay? I have these ideas. They make sense to me. The story of the Bible, no sheep herder has a right to say that. Okay? The, um, the observer, who's been a constant through my 65 years, and I've learned is not my voice. Okay? The dog that does interspecies communication, at least as smart as we are, because we've never managed that. Okay? The fact that life exists, I do expect we're going to find it in a lot of places because it's the opposite of entropy. It's just some, the way the world is. And the observer 
the soul is real. I can't believe that memories are made biomechanically, that memories are made of growing synaptic connections. Because when I'm driving down the road, those flashes, that, those, that information is flying by too fast for the body to build those connections. That's it. Wow. Any questions? Yes. Uh, have you ever attended a political seance? What? I don't know what that is. Uh, well, uh, you have to have ghost voters. Oh. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'm interested. So basically, what you're saying is that based on some experiences and some rather um, evidence that you think you think there may be evidence for a spiritual world or a soul, correct? Your question is that I believe there's evidence for a spiritual war world or a soul. Correct. That makes more sense to me than not having one. Okay. To, to think that the world is mechanical, with memory behaving as it does, with my experience of being constant through my whole lifetime, even though I have been in so many forms, I've been a baby, a toddler, a child, an adolescent, through all those forms, I have remained constant that yes, I believe that it's just simpler for me. It makes more sense. Tim, I have questions yes, that when I came around. There is no proof that the soul exists, but <coughs> philosophers try to make it uh, prove it by inference. <coughs> and that's, I think, what you're doing with all these examples. You're trying to prove it through inferences of, of all these examples. <coughs> And that's what the philosophers did. What do you think? <clears throat> I think that, so the question is that I am inferring a soul, but I have no proof of the soul. Is that good? Well, the examples you came up gave other proof, you know, and those are the inferences that there's a soul by all these examples. Well, the problem, my problem is, I am a theoretical spiritualist. I wish I had the talent to do mathematical or experimental proof, but from my experience, from my, I, from my own lifetime, it just makes it doesn't make sense to me that memories are mechanical. Right? It makes more sense to me that there's an observer. It doesn't make sense to me that a dog who can learn another species language is less than I am. Okay? So, yeah, I don't have I infer the soul. Yes. Okay, I have Tim, but no camera. I have a very interesting question. Thank you so much for your speech. Really, it's greatest for a long time. Very deep, very nice. I can't hear you. Very nice speech. Thank you. Very makes sense. Uh, I have a question. Um, I don't want a camera, Tim. We know that. Okay, thank you. So. You remember you mentioned this lady what you gave website for website? So she had stroke and you mentioned she didn't have any connection um, like spiritually what's going on with her. So my question is, in other words, her soul was working separately from her mind and body? 
And, but that's what my question. What they was working together, in, even she recuperated. So, so explain to me, please, how it works. That's what I think. I think the soul or the consciousness, we might not have the word for it, is separate from the mind and body. Okay? And that's why I also think and you mentioned and you mentioned observer. You mentioned observer. I like that because I have questioned you said it was no observer. So what do you mean by that it was no observer? I didn't say there's no observer. It I was said observer? That there is an observer. I was using the words soul, consciousness, and observer interchangeably. Because but who is observer? The observer, in my case, well, here's the thing. In my case, okay, the observer is this quality that has been with me my whole life. Even though the form I have taken throughout my life has varied greatly. And that's the observer. Yes, observer. Okay, there is, I don't have answers as far as how many observers, and that, 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 but it makes, yes sir. Thank you. Okay. Carl Sagan began one of his segments on TV by announcing that there's a belief out there in the world that's, that certain things that are, um, cannot be weighed or measured exist. And he says, for that belief, there's not a shred of evidence. No, that's not lying, that's bullshitting. Because the definition of evidence is something that can be weighed or measured. <laughs> um, you know, the... Um, I read a, I couldn't finish it because this book was so long and it involved so many names. It was called Priest of Nature and it was a book about the Priest of Nature, the name of the book, was about Isaiah Newton, okay? And it spoke about him and his time, right? He, he lived during a very tumultuous time in England battles between Christians, Protestants. It was a politically correct time. It was very difficult. One of the things that astounded me about this great scientist, Newton, was that he was trying to figure out the true religion. Right? And he believed that after the great flood, Noah and the surviving humans had the true religion and when they, sir, can you move up sir, so I can see the guy I'm trying to address? Thanks. So they, true religion, so, Isaiah, yeah, Isaiah Newton, the great scientist, believed the Bible and that everything, that there was a great flood, all of humans disappeared, the only ones left were Newton and his, were Noah and his family, and they knew the truth, and the truth got diluted, and he was just looking for it, okay? Back in the 18, 1790s, through the 1800s, scientists had no idea of dinosaurs, no. of the dinos of the epochs of the Earth's history, had no idea of glacier glaciation. All right, it wasn't until the 1880s Just give me one minute, okay. that they said that they finally agreed glaciers. Who'd have thought it? But it's true. Okay, scientists thought that the world, the universe was all there was okay, until Hubble, with a telescope, realized <laughs> that one of the fuzzy things that they were looking at was a galaxy in and of itself. And it wasn't until then 
that we knew the extent of the universe. We are living in a time now where science is very strong, but that's a very recent time. Before this, the great scientists, Isaac Newton, had his thoughts. Nobody knew about the history of the world. And, and everybody thought that what they saw in the sky was all there was. Um, so, as I said, let me repeat it here. I've told you already what a theoretical spiritualist is. And as a theoretical spiritualist, I postulate that life is a new law, it's a symmetry of entropy, and that makes sense to me. All right? Yes? I think um, I agree with the, a lot of the things you said tonight, or 99% of it, basically. Um, the problem that we humans have is that we try to define and classify it. I mean, there's an energy field that's going on all around us. We just don't see it. And I mean, you know, like you talked about with this dog. I mean, I, I taught my dog to speak, and he talks to me. Only I don't understand him at the time. You know, so he, so in order to get his message across, sometimes he uses symbols. Like he goes and picks up a stuffed animal, and that means, okay, now I want to go out because I don't understand because he doesn't have a voice box, and so the sounds don't come out. I mean, he knows what he's trying to say. I just don't hear him. But um, but beyond that, when you talked about the um, uh, the, the electron and the positron, positron, yeah, where they 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 merge and then explode, and then there there are there are just waves of energy all around us, sure. and uh, sometimes we're aware of it, and sometimes we're not. Well, talking about your, your observation that there's m waves of energy around us that we are unaware of, but still exist. Okay? Yeah. Uh, of course, not of course, but the elephants, like, it took us a long while to figure out when they put their trunks on the ground, they were listening to a, sub a, a subsonic sound. Mm -hmm. All right? Um, Oh, I wish I remembered what I had to say. Oh, wait. Oh, birds. Birds see in four colors. Okay? I think dogs see in two. All right? I'm not positive. I know some of the nocturnals see in only two, plus black and white. Okay? We see in three plus black and white, so that's five. And birds see in six. They have four primaries. The last, the one that we're missing is ultraviolet. Okay? Now, the thing about that is no one, and we have no way of seeing what they see. We can't, we could make a camera. We have cameras that see ultraviolet. But they convert the ultraviolet violet to a color we can see and then display that on the screen. We have no way of knowing what they see. And it's just another energy, you know. The thing about the ultraviolet is that CSI, all right, when they go into a crime scene, sometimes they take out a lamp and shine it on the bed, and it the ultraviolet fluoresces, I guess, but you'll see an ultraviolet light that plus. And so bodily fluids, things like that, will show up. Urine will show up, all right? And I have to laugh, not laugh, but I I chuckled when I realized that birds see ultraviolet because I pictured a hawk up in the sky just hovering 
and he's and mice as everything else follows a trail in the woods and I just know that they don't have a bathroom where they go to the toilet they just go to the toilet somewhere along that trail and I'm picturing that the hawk looking down sees this trail of ultraviolet and it knows that well that's a mouse highway and it makes hunting for mice or rabbits just so much easier yes sir if the spirit or soul exists separate and apart from the body then apparently we can live on beyond death we can find a new host uh, is that correct then? it might be I don't know the answer. We don't. Say that again. If we're not dependent upon the body as a host, if we are spirit or soul, then we can exist apart from the body and beyond the existence of our bodies and find a new location, right? So the question is, if, this, if we are not our bodies, it's possible for us to find another host. Yeah. Um, you said we don't need a brain or body. No. Why I'll tell you body? that. <laughs> which is it? It's not which. I don't understand the which. Well, then we are free to go anywhere within the universe. You know, we're not confined. Freedom is... I mean, we're not... I can live beyond death, right? So, the question is... With... A, if, this, if there is a soul... And I'm, my, I'm saying there is a soul... And we assume the soul is immortal... Then, what are the consequences? Okay. All right. Some of what you said involved choice. You were saying we can go to do this, do that. I'm describing the universe. Spirit of soul exists and it seeds, <coughs> not locked into physical body or brain. Therefore, it's free to occupy other portions of the world. Here's the what I love about the colleges. You give a talk. And from the questions and answers and comments, you learn about your subject also. You can also learn about your subject. Yeah. There are there are stories. I'm I'm not answering this question well because I haven't looked at this question. There are stories of past lives. Okay? And you have the charlatan past life where they regress you and say and tell you everything you want to hear. You were a pharaoh. Your aunt was Cleopatra. You know, everybody was someone famous. There's also past life where someone finds that he or she understands a language that they never knew. Okay. What are the rules of leaving a body? I don't know, but I know that it's not voluntary. And what are the rules for entering one? And it doesn't have to be a human body. I'm saying that the soul, the consciousness, the observer occupies all life forms. Um,
I'm saying that, in my experience, viewing the world as I do, as I've explained to you, makes more sense to me than viewing it as a clockwork mechanism or viewing humans as superior and everything else inferior, of viewing memory as a biological that is just the interconnection of neurons. What I'm saying is that in my experience, I find that much harder to believe than the alternative, which is life. Life is the opposite of entropy. It involves the consciousness, the soul. We might not have the word for it. But I believe that that is real. Yes? Okay, uh, he what, had a question over here first. Wait, he had a okay. Yes. Well, human consciousness and our ability to perceive is quite limited. Uh, light, for instance, we can only see a narrow band of wavelength. And hearing, we can only hear within a narrow band of wavelength. That wavelength is a little longer for dogs. They can hear sounds that we cannot hear. And uh, sound waves may be infinitely longer than what we can perceive, both longer and shorter. And there may be uh, civilizations right around us which are moving millions of times faster than we are. And trees and rocks may have a consciousness, but they're moving much slower, so we can't tune into their consciousness. Uh, and there are far more insects around than there are human beings. And we can't uh, tap into their communication system, at least not yet. Uh, we've made progress over time. Uh, where do you think we'll be in a couple thousand years? Extinct. Yes. Um, the question is that humans have very limited, have finite or defined sensory perceptions. And uh, there are many other things out there with, uh, with other sensory perceptions. And in a thousand years, where could we possibly be? Um, an interesting thing about human perception, right? There was a TED talk recently. A fellow made a vest that he put that had an array of the vibrators that's on your phone, okay? And someone, a blind and deaf person wore it, okay? And what they would do is they would talk, Can you catch up? a speaker, a microphone, excuse me, would pick up the sound, convert the sound into a pattern on his array of vibrators, like we have, which the fellow would feel in his back, and the fellow learned to hear it. Okay? Um, what we forget is that there's no movie screen in the mind. All right? Uh, for example, video, video cameras. The machine isn't displaying a picture. The machine is displaying a pixel. Each pixel has a color value, a light dark value, and a space. Right? And we assemble that into a picture. Okay? We have limited, not limited, we have the defined inputs, eyes, tongue, ears, fingers, nose, okay? But that's what came with our biology. The mind is capable of taking vibrations from the back and interpreting them as sound, okay? 
Where will we be in a thousand years? Where we could all be dead. We could all be much better than we are. But we'll be spirits. We'll be dead. No. Dead. Our bodies will all be dead. And, uh, are you familiar with, uh, can you comment on uh, the life readings that Edgar Casey gave back in the 20s, 30s? Uh, the, the, there's uh, thousands of readings that were documented by scientists when he was mildly asleep. Uh, his soul or consciousness could locate any other soul or consciousness on the planet. And uh, they used him, he was uh, used as a last resort for many people that were terminally ill. As he, uh, he, he would go sort of into a trance, lay down, I think it was his brother that conducted the reading for a long time, and uh, they would, uh, let me see. Edgar Casey gave life readings where uh, he was called a sleeping prophet, and his soul could contact anybody else, but uh, you, he asked, he couldn't hear me, I just oh. wondered, uh, you're talking about the soul, and the ability to, <clears throat> to go out of body, it's not connected to your body per se, but uh, yes, he said the soul can move forward and backward in time. For anybody that's interested in that, there's a bunch of books on Edgar Casey. It was called The Sleeping Prophet. Yeah, okay. It, 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 I don't know any of this. I don't, I've heard the name, but I don't know the history of Edgar Casey. And I haven't said that we can come and go from the body. That was Charlie's question also. Can we come and go from the body? That's not been my experience, but I have said that it makes more sense to me to view, as I look back on almost 70 years of life, and, have, and know that I've gone through the changes of baby, toddler, child, adolescent, all different creatures and having not changed, haven't been the same observer. Where are we going? I know that my my experience is that that constant looks is a soul or a consciousness. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far I have never been able to leave it at will or do anything else like that and I don't know anything about Edgar Case except the name. Any others? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, when, when a person dies, he's got an unmistakable look of death. Any doctor will tell you. They can just look at the person. You can see it. Now, do you think that's the soul leave, transmigrating from the body? The soul leaving the body and uh, maybe going to heaven or hell? Do you believe in heaven or hell, by the way? You know, um, you brought up religion. Well, that's what and religion is some, well, conventional religion. And conventional religions are something that um, I'm not speaking to, okay? They're very interesting, um, super interesting. Now, but what happens when you die? What happens? I don't know. I don't know what happens when you die, but I will bring up this mystery to you. When you look at a, where are you? If I cut off your pinky, do you lose? If I cut off your arm, if you lose both arms, if you lose both arms and both legs, you've certainly changed. But is someone who experiences that the same person? When you go under a microscope and you see blood flowing to a muscle, oxygen coming out, you see all this chemistry, and yet somehow there's a super a, that's alive. I mean, what's the difference? Why is the chemistry that is still in that body? In other words, why can you not, like Frankenstein, hit it with a zap of electricity and say, it's alive? They do that resuscitate. They do resuscitate the heart. Yes, sir. Ed, I read that um, Last question. 45% of the people believe there are spirits or souls floating around the world. And amazingly enough, 28% claim to have seen them someplace. 
Do you agree with that? Do you have any comment on that? This will be the last no. question. Well, let me ask can if we, anyone else. Can we see spirits of souls? Do we encounter them anywhere? Well, I have to agree with you because you I assume you're, I'll ask you, are you quoting a legit, a study of a, a survey? Are you quoting a survey? Well, yeah. Thank you. And the survey results are as you reported. And if you're asking me if I disagree with the survey results, I would say no. But if you're asking me if it's, if the survey results hold water, right? I would say, look at all the people who voted and loved Donald Trump. That doesn't make much sense either. To you. But if you do a survey, you're going to find a lot of people who think he's not a liar. And it's, it's just the way people are. Now, before we, just, we stop this, I mean, this part, I have to ask, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question who wants to ask a question? Yes. yes. I, I just wanted to question, well, I would like to say Charlie's, you know, a soul possibly being able to enter another host. And um, I guess my question is, um, why do we celebrate this holiday when we enter the veil of darkness? I haven't done, you know, a very big study, but apparently established religions who know more about the soul than we do have thought enough of it to call it All Souls Day, and they are worshiping something that um, is not just like Aunt, Aunt So-and-so who, who was here and is no longer here, but they're worshiping souls. So my question is, just a big question mark, I guess, is like greater theologians than we have given real credence to the soul. Question mark? It became a question. <laughs> okay, to answer that, I would say that I'm only talking about my, oh, I'm only talking about my, my experience. Um, and that's, that's all I can talk about. But while I was assembling this talk over the past months, one of the things that made me chuckle was I realized that all of us, all of us All right, here, order, please. Hello, the guys back there. Hello. One fool at a time. One fool at a time, please. Guys, you're telling me to be quiet. So, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up. Or I'm a, so anyway, what I realized when I was assembling this talk over the last few months, and I called myself a theoretical spiritualist, as I explained, I realized that we're all theoretical spiritualists. All of us, whether we're atheists or, or religious people, have looked at the world, have made sense of it, and that's theoretical, and it's spiritual. Some of it is theoretical anti-spiritualism, but it's theoretical. I'm putting it under the umbrella of theoretical spiritualism. We are all theoretical spiritualists. I am not a theoretical spiritualist. Let's give our speaker a hand. Okay, uh, we entered a famous rebuttal period here at the Kowser Complexes. Uh, we have a slightly shorter rebuttal time tonight, uh, but we should have enough if there's less than the nine or ten people want to give a rebuttal. Who want, who feels like trying to give a rebuttal tonight? We got one here, two. There'll people, be more coming. Three. Make it about five five minutes you each. Know, put Charlie's got his hand. We'll go with four minutes like we always do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Take a look at the time, Charlie. You, you look at the time. It's after it's eight o'clock. o'clock. We got five people. Well, six with me, and somebody else will be up here. We'll have seven or eight before we get through.
Okay. Uh, witchcraft predates all religions. I want to say that if you hold up one hand like this, and you hold another hand like this, as straight as you possibly can, and then you gradually raise it up and down, you will literally feel an energy on this hand. Uh, nobody knows, you're not holding your arm straight, man. Uh, nobody knows why this is, but this is something that uh, people who are into witchcraft will point out to enforce their concepts of uh, witchcraft. Uh, I only brought that up to say that there are many things that we do not understand. We see many things that we do not know. Uh, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of. And that's from Shakespeare. And that's all I've got to say. Next. States alone. Uh, part of that is due to improved medical uh, techniques and knowledge. Uh, people who used to die, they were able to bring them back. And people who've been through near-death experiences, their lives are changed. There have been ghost tours in different parts of the country. In fact, there's a ghost tour going on in Chicago that, that you can be a part of. There have been many uh, unusual experiences. I have a, a friend who picked up uh, Resurrection Mary a number of years ago. Uh, Resurrection Mary um, died uh, out in the uh, Willowbrook uh, on Archer Avenue, and a number of people who had picked her up uh, and after they've gone about a mile to the entrance of the cemetery, she's gone. She just disappears in their car. There's a lot of things like that going on. People who are in uh, born-again, spirit-filled churches can point, point to all kinds of miracles and healings and prophecies that they can see. Uh, open your minds. Open yourselves, because there's an awful lot of stuff out there that you can become aware of if you want to. Thank you. All right. Okay. Introduce yourself. I'm Norma Miller, and uh, uh, in response to both the speaker, who I totally agree with you about us having a spirit that's a soul that goes beyond our physical um, machinations, right? And the near-death experiencing. Some people rebut the near-death experiencing. Well, yeah, that was just wild brain activity that happens <coughs> while you're dying. But, well, I've had, uh, working in mental health, I've had connections with people who've had some near-death experiences, 
one, I asked her about it, and she said, well, yeah. Thank you. God told me I had to come back, and I didn't want to, and I had a big argument with God, and he made me come back. <laughs> and she went on to help other people with mental illnesses. In, you know, as she grew through her issues. So she had a lot of work left in here. And I've known people who've talked to me about near death experiences and it being fantastically beautiful. And one guy was really depressed and he did not want to come back. And he was mad that they made him come back. <laughs> but what a fabulous experience it was. Okay, so then if it's just your brain activity, <coughs> how come when my brother was killed when I was 11 and he was 18, that evening after everybody had gone home that came to express their condolences and stuff, my mom saw my brother in, a, in the bedroom doorway in a halo of light, smiling and waving goodbye. My husband, when he was two and a half, he said, he said when he was two and a half, that when he was two and a half, he saw his dad in his uniform come through the bedroom door, which was closed, and say, I love you, Richie, and then faded back through the bedroom door, and they got the telegram the next day that he had passed in a fire on the ship that he was on in the southeast seas. So, um, just this week, um, after a friend of mine had passed about three weeks ago, I got an email from the, one of the people that was close to him that he had had a vivid dream that our friend was coming down a hallway towards him, came to him and gave him a hug. He had an intensely happy feeling that he felt he got from this friend who passed. And then he passed through his body on down the hallway. So, you know, those are just a few of the things. I've read a lot about near-death experiences, too. And that's just a few of the experiences that I've talked to people about, that people have shared with me. That Kind of convinced me, you know, there is a spiritual life after death. What happens? I mean, I could picture my mom going off to the highest heavens. She was like, oh, wow. Gotta, you know, gotta find out what's going on up here. You know, this is great. My dad being more earthbound, I could feel him more around. We'll talk to you. You know, where his flowers were and stuff like that. So, you know, what happens later, I don't know. Uh, different religions say, oh yeah, you come, if you had a miserable, you know, we're a miserable person in life, you might come back and have to live through getting it done to you or whatever. Different religions have different stuff about it. But one of the guys who was so, our arms to the Iran Contras said, that in his near-death experience, and other people have had life reviews, he had a life review in which he had to experience the pain of everybody that was injured or killed by the weapons that he sold to the Contras, and the pain that the family members and friends experienced in their loss in his life review while he was in his near-death experience. So. Okay, next. Next. Okay. Next. Who's next for the rebuttal? I'll go next. Okay, thank you for giving me a chance. I'm going to go out on a real limb here because tomorrow morning I'm going to be at a place called Springbrook Community Church. It's a Baptist denomination. And they all, and the spirit, world, and the soul is an integral part of Christianity. We're going to celebrate communion tomorrow at my church, which is the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And for a man like Jesus Christ who claims he was God, he was either the the Lord himself, a lunatic, or a liar. I'm not going to get into what you think about him, but there are certain claims that are made by the Bible about your choice of what you think of Jesus Christ. Eternal consequences about the soul and about the choice you make between going to heaven and hell. I do believe in this stuff myself. I do believe there's an adequate explanation and scientific evidence for it but it all boils down to this we're all sinners before holy god he provided a blood sacrifice in the form of his son jesus christ to forgive us of our sins and when you believe in him you'll not perish but have everlasting life high claims for a religion you bet a lot of it be proven I believe so. Maybe not God himself, but a lot of the claims that he has made, <coughs> as well as certain things like scriptural inerrancy and other topics that make the spirit world real. It has been appointed once to life, once to die, and then the judgment. What you think about God is your business. He gave us free will. He gave us the freedom of choice. And that is something we all should be thankful for. For me, I choose life. I choose to have a boss in my life, and that's what I consider Jesus Christ. I've made it very clear now to the college where I stand on this issue. I'm not going to force anybody to believe what I believe because God has his own way of convincing you otherwise or not. With that, I'll end this rebuttal. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go early this time. Let's thank our speaker for covering a lot of topic here. Thank you, Ed. Okay, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, the, uh, regarding which somebody mentioned witches in the Wicca, we used to have a uh, witch here on Halloween. Uh, one thing I would tell you about the practice, if you could afford it, you went, you got ill and you could afford it. You went to a doctor like Victor. You know, pay because he didn't charge you high prices. If you really had a little less money, you went to the priest, the priestly class. And if you had no money at all, you went to the local woman in the village uh, or the witch, and she would give you some herbs. And that's where you get herbs and healing like that. And people still prescribe this as the way to go for get to get healing by going and finding some plants in your backyard. Uh, but that's and they call them now earth-based religions. Earth-based religions is the is the term that's used for them. Uh, regarding this mind-body dichotomy, the one the person who comes to mind always is the philosopher uh, Rene Descartes. Uh, he said this expression, I think, therefore I am. He, he tried to achieve like pure thought. He laid in a bed and, and just thought. And he thought this, this would be like the essence of, of, in, of intellect. He'd be pure mind or spirit. And then it's, of course, not every philosopher uh, subsequently has praised him. Dr. Bob is around here, so is Doug. Any of these guys can tell you, guys came along and, uh, you know, had more demanding criteria for truth um, or, or epistemology, knowledge. Uh, existentialists demanded to see things. They didn't believe in this unseen world. Probably just the opposite. It's difficult regarding spiritual world. I'm sorry, I'm rooted in one that requires tested measurements of phenomena to grant it any existence. Your anecdotes are very, very nice stories. I imagine they're very genuine experiences, but the fact that we cannot measure or assess their validity, I don't know of what real interest they are to the community at large in terms of human knowledge. Uh, it, it's separate experiences experiences have to be done thing. Now regarding the dog, I like this thing 
Actually, I studied a lot of verbal learning in school and about this dog that you could teach to read. Uh, I knew that trick too. You take the 200 most common words in the English language and you put them on flashcards. And I used to teach my kids taught elementary school and you, you, you call that word association, you put them on flashcards and you get them, you get them allegedly to read. Because we don't read, we don't sound out things. We just remember one thing like play, four people. We just remember that symbol. And that's what the guy did, but it's kind of interesting. Might try that. I've been training my cats to do all kinds of little tricks. I was going to sell them to the circus in a while here, but I, I never thought about teaching him to read. But anyhow, it's called serial learning, uh, where you learn long lists of things. Admittedly, a thousand is a lot for a dog. Uh, that's a lot for anybody. Um, but the vocabulary is about 1,500 if you want to learn a language or learn how to read something like Chinese or something like that. Uh, regarding spirit world, my research indicated that uh, you know, what are the spirits? A lot of people think if books fall, I like this, if books fall off your bookcase, is there a spirit around? Or if you hear footsteps in the attic? Uh, or I've taken many photographs and they call it an orb, where you get a big white light. I guess that's a ghost. We actually had a guy a few years ago here at the college, he, he conducted a class on how to photograph a spirit. I remember this was many years ago. He went in his backyard and his cat passed away and he showed me a photo. He went back there and he photographed this cat floating around his backyard. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, yeah, the only people I have experience is 28 people profess to having uh, seen a spirit in one form or another. Uh, the, uh, the thing is, they've also discovered that the sensation of a spirit could also be due to something like existing vibrations in a room, like in this room there may be what they call infrasound, meaning the machinery, the fans, or something like that are producing a vibration. And people may mistake that for the presence of a spirit. They replicated this in the laboratory. A guy would put people in this laboratory and they would experience a sensation, ghost-like presence or experiences and things like that. But they think it's due to conditions in a room Will, will induce this uh, low frequency, continuous emitting of a stimulus, somehow will even affect the eyes and result in visions. Anyhow, thank you very much. Come again, Ed. Thank you. Or your spirit can come again. <laughs> Whichever it is. <laughs> May your spirits be here next week. I'll be here in spirit. Uh, you people are probably familiar with CPR. Oh, you yeah. don't go home with people. Yeah. Right. Uh, I had the fortune of uh, participating in those, and um, and I uh, did uh, recover some, and some didn't make it. <coughs> and when they didn't make it, I was on the lookout. I didn't see anything. Somebody told me it's the last breath that you take, that's your soul. So, people that I had on the respirators, I would pull their, disconnect the respirator, and I could watch their last breath, but nothing. So, I don't know whether it's, there is such thing, really. It, uh, Many people say that uh, maybe if you watch closely, you may see something fly away. But uh, nothing like that uh, was observed by me. Maybe some of you may have, may have seen it. But uh, this was first-hand observation, and sorry to say, there was nothing there. What about the ones you resuscitated? Well, the ones you resuscitated? 
Okay, a um, couple things that weren't mentioned. Um, lady here said, was it you that said there's thousands of uh, near-death experiences? Well, somebody back there did, so, and that's research. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, the, there's thousands of cases of documented research where the doctors pronounce somebody dead on the table, and they're dead for a couple of minutes, and then they're trying to resuscitate them. You know, no brainwave activity, just flatline. They're officially dead, and for that two minutes, their, uh, their soul or consciousness or whatever you call it, leaves the body and goes out down the hall, and they can report who's in the waiting room, uh, grieving relatives that were you know waiting for the person to die, and when they recover, uh, they wake back up, and the doctor, you know, they say to the doctor, it, uh, is my aunt here, or my cousin still here, I saw them. They can describe what these people were wearing, where, you know, they, they, there's no way they, they could know these things. It's called out-of-body experience. Um, the people that have psychic ability have claimed uh, there's something called astral projection, where you have the ability to project your consciousness out to someplace else and view what's there. And from the 70s to the late 80s, uh, the U.S. Army had a top secret program called remote viewing, where they could train people to uh, just clear their mind, and it is a, a training type of technique. It was top secret with the military, but they were able, a general uh, that oversaw the program said, even if you can show me this works, I'm still not going to believe it. <laughs> yeah, because it's unbelievable. He said, uh, and the program kind of uh, petered out or came to an end sort of in the late 1980s, just before the Cold War ended. It, uh, the remote viewers were tasked with trying to keep track, psychically keep track of where the Soviet nuclear submarines were. And it became, for them, it became more interesting to keep track of the other underwater craft that were shadowing the submarines. And that was a third body of submarines on the planet that weren't ours and weren't Soviets. And those, those, those craft, when they were in the water, they were called submarines. When they came out and flew in the air, they were called UFOs. So um, the psychics have sensed that there's uh, other civilizations out here, you know, for a long time. Um, what he was, the Russians back in the late 50s or 60s developed uh, a type of photography. It's called Curlian, K-I-R-L-I-N, Curlian photography where they had special cameras that could photograph the psychic aura around people, the biological radiation. Uh, anybody that works with animals or you know, has done research on it knows uh, dogs especially can sense several hundred yards away when their owner is approaching, coming <coughs> home. They sense the brain waves. It doesn't matter which way the wind's blowing or if they're in a high-rise apartment that's completely sealed. They're not sensing the smell or the noise or anything else. It's the brain waves. And they did all kinds of studies. All, all living things uh, radiate, like radiate something called what? I'd like to see those studies. My the, cats can tell me. Can they're tell all I, Charlie, I'll, I'll bring you a list next week if you want. I'm a block away from all my cats. Or you can Google this? it. You put a, put a hidden camera in your place, and then watch, with a clock on the timer, and watch how the cat reacts when you get within 100 yards or 50 yards. So there's brain waves, my brain waves enter my house 100 yards away. It, more than that. More Psychic than that. My, my brain waves are emanating in this room. Well, yours might not even be going that far. But <laughs> <laughs> other, others, others is... <laughs> <laughs> there's all Charlie, there's Where'd all kinds of Charlie, else? let me say, let me speak. There's all kinds of research on identical twins. They sense if one falls and breaks an arm, at the very instant that happens, the other one, a hundred miles away in another city, will feel the pain and know that it happened. They're they're psychically connected by biological radiation, the brain waves. And it doesn't they've estimated that that kind of transmission is at the speed of light or instantaneous. And there's there's all kinds of studies. And on that. The, there's not, no study that the Charlie, shut. emits waves. Where's that study? Okay.
What do you call this wave? Well, there were studies. I told you last week, Charlie. I'll, I'll, I'll give you 21 odds. Here's a $20 bill. Get a dollar bill on and put your money where your mouth is or shut up and let me talk. Well, what okay? do you call this Put your money wave? where your mouth is. What are these waves? I think they're, they're called they're communist brain waves. waves. They're high frequency what biological oh, brain the waves. Time. They have instruments that can sense them. So what is the, 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 fact, the fact that you don't know about it, no. it doesn't mean that it doesn't it's exist. Different. I don't have time to educate well, anyway, you. Anyway, he's the man that's talking. Well, so it, like, we have, we have a, uh, you know, I hear I've lost a minute to heckling from the peanut gallery in the back. So would you let would you let me finish? Well, your brain waves should have one pool at a time. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but if, if you want to see interesting stuff on this, look up the subject of remote viewing. There was a book called Out There that was published in like 1990-91 that talked about the success of the remote viewing program, and that's one of the reasons the Cold War came to an end, because the Russians had people that could view where our atomic subs were, and we were keeping track of theirs, and the third body of aircraft was just messing with the radar all over the place. So it was it was time to move on. We got, but we got it, drones now. We yeah, we, we have uh, drones and everything else, but... Um, Yes. A lot, you know, millions and millions and millions of people have, have had out-of-body experiences during surgery. Where, uh, where they didn't die, they were just uh, unconscious, and they, were, they, they saw themselves walking around the hospital looking at stuff while they're completely unconscious. And then when they wake up, they're back in their body. That, that there's been so many of those things documented that the science on it, they're still trying to study how it happens, but they know it does happen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and I think there's overwhelming existence that uh, people have consciousness. Oh, God. All right. Um, what? We got our, one, speaker, we got, our speaker will get the last word. We got one more rebutter. Uh, somebody want and one more last rebutter? <coughs> yeah, we got four minutes. Why is this so hard to study, Andy? Uh, not really a rebuttal because I unfortunately missed the speech, but I heard some of the, what he said in the question and answer. Um, uh, I, I think part of this, uh, based on what I was hearing about the conversation, I think the uh, Part of what I was hearing is this discussion about uh, what we know and what's possible. And it made me think of uh, Einstein. Uh, when he came up with the theory of relativity, and they actually figured out a way to test it. Somebody came up with the idea to test the theory of relativity. Exactly. And uh, uh, this, uh, it was an astronomer in um, England, who went to Africa and set up a camera for a, a solar eclipse. According to the theory of relativity, uh, light uh, is affected uh, by gravity. Yeah. I mean, how, how could you even imagine that? And so they proved this by, by going to a solar eclipse and being able to photograph a star that was, where, uh, that was positioned in the sky right next to the sun. Now, in theory, the light coming from the star going to Earth, as it passed the sun, if, the, if it's affected by gravity, the, the visually, the position of the star would appear to shift towards the sun. And that's exactly what happened. Now, now I just find this like mind-boggling, uh, that a person on his own can just come up with this idea about how light works. That's completely foreign to people how, how people understand. And, and imagine if you went up to somebody two, three hundred years ago and said, "Light uh, has weight, and light can be affected uh, by light, huge objects," and people would just laugh at you. So there, so for me, that's like a, a favorite example of how people can be completely ignorant of stuff and and even let their biases reject ideas. Uh, and then down the road, it's accepted is is commonly understood fact. And there's, I imagine everybody can come up with an example like that. So that's say that's speaking to the idea that there are lots. There's just tons of stuff that I guarantee we don't know. And if we were around in a hundred years, we'd be shocked at what would be common knowledge. But on the other hand, magical thinking. Okay, there is a great danger to magical thinking. And the, and the way I see it is that, there, that we're, there's a part of our brain that is, that is basically passed down from our ancestors 100,000 years ago. 
and there's a ton of emotions going on there and fear and survival instincts and part of that is in all of our brains and so we tend to be biased and we are not even aware of it. In fact, scientists have, when they do experiments, they have to do these double blind tests because there's no way they can get the bias, teach people to not, scientists, to not be biased. They have to do double blind tests. If you have these, sci if you have these um, uh, biases and you start seeing things and you start making assumptions on anecdotal evidence, I think that tends to lead to magical thinking, and that can be, and that can be really dangerous. And I think the greatest example of that right now is uh, the climate change denialists. There are a lot of people who are Christians who are denying science, uh, the science, because in their brain they're like, "Well, God would let, never let this happen." This is actually documented. This is this is going on. There's a there's a large group of people who say, well, the end of the earth would never happen because God just wouldn't let it happen. So that means that this climate change stuff is a bunch of hooey. And this is a threat to the existence of literally hundreds of millions of people in the world. So it's um I I just really think that magical thinking is a great danger, and it I think that uh, if you hear anecdotal evidence, that's a great place to start but use a scientific process, try to get empirical evidence to support conclusions before you say, well, I've heard 400, 500 stories, so I'm just going to accept that they're true. I think that that uh, is, is a formula to lead you to have false belief systems. Thanks. All right. it all does boil down to false belief systems. I'm fat. Um, you know, for me, the idea that memories are made of physical connections that grow at the speed of travel with all the information, you're traveling in a car, you're seeing bridges, other cars, signs, trees, everything go by, and we're told that this is a memory, which we're not told that, we know it's a memory, but we're told it's a result of synapse connections that are happening at the speed of a car traveling at 60 or 70 miles an hour down the highway as scenes flash by. Um, I know that muscle memory is indeed a, um, a connection, a learned connection, and that can be lost. I, I do not see the body growing connections as fast as necessary to create memories, to replicate what we all remember when we're driving down the road at 60 miles an hour. Um, How much of it do you remember? Magical thinking, I gave you examples of scientists who believe the Bible. Isaac Newton was looking for Noah. It's, what I'm saying is that it's easier for me to believe that there's more than meets the eye than it is for me to believe that the world is a clockwork. Um, and there we go. Thank you. Thank All right. You. All right, Andy, gamble us out. Hey, that's it for Halloween weekend, and uh, well, hopefully we will see you all next week. We're adjourned. Don't fear the reaper. Sit there.